Hello everyone. So this is your host Shitish Maurya, and uh, welcome to Algo Trading Conference. Yeah, uh, and uh, today uh, we will be uh, joined by uh, nine industry leaders from various backgrounds in trading domain, and there will be four workshops and one panel discussion. So uh, fasten your seatbelt and grab a cup of coffee or tea for today's ride full of knowledge and wisdom that will change the way. how you perceive trading as a profession okay so uh, to start off with our first session on micro alphas financial geology uh, we are joined by dr thomas stark from sydney australia dr stark is the ceo at triple a quants and he is an expert in artificial intelligence and quantum computing domain so uh, hey dr stark are you here with us Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, can I can hear you, and we can see you as well. Excellent. Thank you for taking your time and joining us here in the Algo Trading Conference, Dr. Stark. So before we start, uh, uh, a quick introduction. So a lot of you already know about Dr. Stark. He is one of the esteemed EPAR faculty members, and he has shared his experience on many occasions in the past. Dr. Stark has a PhD in physics. and uh, he is currently leading the quant trading team in one of the leading top trading firms in australia at its triple a quants as its ceo he has also held a senior research fellow position at oxford university uh, dr stark has previously previously worked at the proprietary trading firm vivian coat and uh, at memjet australia uh, the world leader in high speed printing he has led uh, led strategic research projects for rolls royce and also the co-founder of microchip design company tsmi so uh, without uh, taking any further time dr stark i'll pass on the presentation right with you and uh, stage is yours thank you okay so here we go um can you okay can you see my screen yes dr stark we can see your screen yes uh okay let's go into the slide show Okay, Looks can you perfect. see it? Slide show? Yes. All right. So, hello everyone. Thanks so much uh for this uh attending this session. Um and hello from Sydney, Australia. It's quite late in the evening here and I hope uh you have had a good day or a good morning so far. Today I want to talk a little bit about what I call financial technology just to make the title a bit more interesting and I explain to you in a moment. Um what that actually means so uh we've already oops we've already talked about my bio so i skipped that little part now if you want to get in touch with me uh you can contact me on linkedin or on my email actually um i just realized this is uh four a's uh it's actually triple a quants.com so if you want to contact me via email just skip one of these a's uh, thank you I've also got a YouTube channel where I post little topics in quantitative trading or programming or some some things like that if you want to check it out just go on YouTube and punch in Dr Tom Stark and you see it and of course I've got a Twitter handle as well at Dr Tom Stark so it's fairly simple it's mostly my name and you can find me quite easily okay so uh, today I want to talk a little bit about the idea of micro alphas and i call this a uh, financial uh, geology why did i do this um so you probably uh, know that back in the days uh, we had open outcry financial markets we had stock exchanges where people were screaming and shouting around and it was pretty chaotic at least uh, it looked like that from the outside whereas now we've got very much a uh, screen based uh, trading and not even that uh, nowadays uh, even screens can't really tell what's going on anymore and we've got algorithms so people just spend time in offices and running trading algorithms now in some ways uh, that is a little bit analogous to what things used to be back in the days um when we had uh, the gold rush and so what people used to do is basically go out and you know pan gold nuggets out of rivers and try to find you know make their fortune like this now unfortunately 
these times uh, in an analogy which is kind of similar to what we oops what we had before they, they are also gone and today we have this replaced by these huge machines that basically try to extract tiny little specks of gold dust out of tons and tons of rock and why is that a good analogy uh, look at this chart here or look at this this slide what you can see is basically a stock chart and in the old days you know you had things like good old moving averages or some other trend indicators and you could go long when they cross one way and then go short when they cross another and you could actually make money now unfortunately uh, these days are pretty much gone as well uh, those uh, simple technical indicators really don't work anymore so much and this is really replaced now by you know really heavy machinery of data analytics high frequency execution low latency uh, machine learning artificial intelligence and really uh, the analogy here is that we went from finding uh, you know little solid gold nuggets like here uh, where we just literally have a simple uh, simple easy to understand thing like a gold nugget uh, with not much else oops uh sorry my my trackpad uh, does funny things and uh, from that today we moved to a much much more complex trading and you know this and really what this is is like extracting gold dust from tons and tons of rock and you know of course uh, you may think yeah you know these things are still working all right but when you look at professional trading, uh, it's not really that, it's mostly that. And what I wanna talk about today is really, how does this look in reality? Now, um, of course, I cannot give you a really detailed and, and, and super in-depth uh, expose on that because there's simply not enough time. But what I would like is just to give you a nice overview of uh, how, a lot of the professional uh, firms today trade and how they make money and how this analogy from extracting gold dust in tons of rock comes about because really it's not that we can't make money from the markets anymore but it's just gotten very different and instead of uh, doing easy simple things like panning we have to now go in with heavy machinery and what I want to show you today is a little bit, what is the quantitative basis for this heavy machinery? What does this look like? And give you a feel for it. And hopefully just give you a little uh, overview and inspire you uh, to maybe have a look yourself because really it's not that uh, what we're doing here is totally uh, confined to heavy uh, machinery and professional trading, but aspects of this can also be successfully used uh, for you traders at home if, if you're a retail trader and so on so it might actually be really interesting for you to hear about this now we're talking about uh, micro alphas first of all let's understand what a conventional definition of alpha really is and the way we understand this is basically we've got uh, the market returns, so the return is the percentage change from one day to the next, for example. So, you know, if today's uh, price was, uh, market price was 100 and tomorrow's is 101, you've got a 1% change or 0.01% or 0.01 change. And same if you have strategy returns here, you can see that um, we've got these. Uh, percentage changes of your strategy return. Now, um, the alpha is basically the correlation uh, between the market return and usually market return, when we talk about this, we talk about some sort of benchmark. So let's just say you trade the US market or US stocks, then your benchmark would perhaps be the S&P 500 or the SPY ETF. And then um, you correlate this to the return of your strategy and you see whether there is a correlation and if there is then um, that correlation gives you uh, two parameters one is alpha one is beta beta is basically the how high the correlation is between your strategy and the market in this case 37.8 uh, percent 
And alpha is also what we call idiosyncratic returns. They're basically all the returns uh, that are not related uh, to the actual returns of the market. So there's specific returns that in a sense symbolize the skill of the trader of the asset manager uh, that uses them. And they're basically uh, symbolized by where this orange line here, this fitting line uh, crosses uh, the zero line. So where this crosses the zero line on the Y axis, this is our alpha. And normally when we talk about alpha, we talk about an annualized alpha. So for example, if we have this, uh, we have to, we get this fitting curve, we get an alpha, and then we multiply this usually uh, by a factor of the number of your trading days. So if you have say 256 days, in a trading year, then then that's the multiplier 256, and we get we get our annualized alpha here. In this case, it's 15.3% uh, for this particular strategy. Now, for our micro alphas uh, or trading alphas, the definition is a little bit uh, different, uh, but not that much. And we call really, uh, or in 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 professional terms, often alpha. You know, is is a term that is quite loosely used for anything that generates uh, returns that are not correlated uh, to the market. So, um, what we really uh, look at when we say, "Oh, we have an alpha," we look at, uh, for example, a trading signal, and then we look at our strategy return, and the correlation between them uh, gives us also, as we've seen before, an alpha and a beta. In this case, you can see the line is quite good. Um, so effectively, an alpha is something of a predictive signal. So it's not really the alpha as, as we understand it from asset management, but an alpha is the idea of having something that gives you a predictive signal. And I talk a little bit about this later, uh, what could be predictive signals. But first of all, uh, to understand uh, alpha is some sort of a construct or a strategy that contains some predictiveness or some information uh, about where the market is going. So I hope uh, that makes some sense to you. So please, uh, when you hear this term alpha, see it in a more wide and, and loose, uh, see it in more widely uh, spread and loose terms than the traditional uh, financial alpha. Now in today's markets, unfortunately, when we look at alphas, before we actually looked at an alpha, which was the moving average crossover, that's a, a good example of a relatively simple alpha. Now, unfortunately, if you have ever tried back testing moving average crossovers, in most markets, they don't really work anymore. And um, of course, prove me wrong, and perhaps there are some markets where this still could work, but in most markets, really those simple trading signals or alphas don't quite work anymore. So why is this? Well, first of all, we have far more players because it's much easier to access equity markets or, or generally financial markets today. We've got high frequency traders and they make the market very, very efficient. When we talk about efficiency, what it effectively means is they make the markets more and more random. And the more random a market is, the more difficult it literally becomes to consistently extract uh, profits from that market. So more randomness means more noise. And if a market is perfectly random, then it's actually impossible to consistently uh, generate profits. Now, um, what that also means is that Overall, the alphas or the predictive um, and predictive uh, uh, indicators or whatever you you want to use become uh, less effective, so they become a lot weaker. So you can see this here uh, in the previous slide. You can see that you know we've got a good correlation between our trading signal and our strategy returns, and a lot of the alphas nowadays uh, you can see here. They do have some sort of slope, but they're actually extremely weak. And this is, in fact, uh, the reality today for most trading signals that you will ever look at. The predictiveness is fairly weak. Now, for a lot of people, they do this and they try a couple of trading signals 
and then they go well it's actually super hard to predict anything and it's in fact quite easy to give up at this point and say well you know i just tried all these different trading signals none of them works and so what can i do you know i'm maybe not really uh, continuing in the market but this is exactly where these micro alphas come in and and where if we look at the bigger picture we can actually still somehow generate profits if we're smart and and if we play our cards well now what can we do um and the idea really comes from uh, machine learning and as as you might know i've been in machine learning for quite a while and i've used it a lot in financial markets but it's not as simple often uh, to use machine learning uh, it's it's a great tool but it's not as straightforward as perhaps in other fields of machine learning such as image recognition or things like that or, or natural language processing uh, financial markets are a bit more difficult but nevertheless uh, if you really look at it you can make it work for yourself now the idea here really is just as in machine learning, that if we have a multitude of weak predictors, we can actually produce a stronger uh, predictor. And often in, in machine learning, this method, this method is called an ensemble method. Or sometimes uh, uh, one of these ensemble methods is called bagging or bootstrap aggregating. And what we're basically doing here is we're taking a number of weak predictors and we transform them in a certain way um with different uh um, things that i don't want to go into too much uh for machine learning but i will get into them uh for finance financial data so we're basically using this idea uh, of bagging or bootstrap aggregating and what we hope is that we get a new uh, trading signal which is a combination of different uh, weaker predictors which has le less variance and also, if we use the right techniques, we can also uh, try to avoid overfitting. Of course, avoiding overfitting is virtually impossible. It's, it's very, very difficult to do. So there will always be a small element of overfitting. Even if you take the best precautions uh, that you can, unfortunately, that is just how it is. But nevertheless, if you're very aware of it, if you're very cognizant of what's going on, what's happening, then you can at least uh, minimize the effect as much as possible. Now, um, this is uh, this chart shows a little bit how this uh, can play out and how this can work. So, let's just say you found an alpha. Let's just say uh, you've got the uh, moving average crossover. Now, I told you before that uh, generally this is not really a trading signal that works anymore but that doesn't mean it could perhaps work as a weak predictor within the framework of a micro alpha uh, combined or uh, aggregated strategy and um, what you can for example uh, do is this and this is part of the uh, this is step one uh, of, of, of the machine learning and it's called a bootstrap I call it a system parameter permutation, but there's there's many different words for it. And what you do is basically, instead of just using a strategy that has just one specific set of parameters, say uh, your moving average crossover, which is actually two parameters, which are the look back periods of the two moving averages, what you do is you go and you basically run back tests sweeping across a wide wide range of different parameters so you're basically uh, taking all these different look back windows that you can find for your two moving averages and you create lots and lots of strategies and you back test them uh, using that so for example um, here we have this uh, so what we have done is We've done all these different, there's literally thousands of different parameter sets, uh, say for a moving average crossover in this chart. And what we do is we then split the results into a train and a test set. So 
we're basically generating the parameters, uh, we're generating results for the train set, so we get a sharp ratio for that, and then we get the sharp ratio for the test set. And what we can, or what we want to see is not just the best set of parameters that we can find, because often, you know, what that means is we're actually cherry picking, we're actually, in a sense, overfitting. We say, oh, this is the best parameter set, and we take this, well, Will it be the best one in the future? Perhaps, but most likely not. But instead, what we do is this. We go ahead and we plot a chart of all the different parameter sets available. And what we want to see is a correlation between the test parameter or between the, the metric that we choose, in this case, the sharp ratio between our train set and our test set. And if we can do this, and we see that there is a correlation and we can say, well, actually, this strategy overall has an information spill from your training samples to your test samples. And this way we can say, well, this strategy is actually reasonably re robust to overfitting. And what that also means is, for example, we could pick a region here, which I've done here. So this is um, this chart is basically the same as this, but then we did some uh, clustering. So for example, um, you could use a k-means clustering or some other clustering algorithms, and then you pick perhaps the cluster that you see is is your favorite. Like for example, this one here. This this would give you the most interesting results. And then what you can do is. You can actually pick a number of these uh, train test parameters. And if you do this, then you can be reasonably assured that if you run all of them at the same time, your result will probably be somewhere along this fitting line here, somewhere in the, in the center or, in, or at least somewhere in the, inside the average of the performance of all these uh, different parameter sets. So we could already see that we just pick one parameter set, there is a high chance that this might not work. But if we know that uh, the train set or, or the, 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 the period with, with which we are trained, our algorithm informs an out of sample period, then we can say, well, actually, if we pick a set of those, then we can be reasonably assured that we get the performance that is somewhere at the average of all of these data points in that cluster. Now, the other thing that is also interesting is that when we do, when we split our uh, data into a train and a test set, we could just accidentally split them in, in a favorable or in a really unfavorable way. And that could give us some uh, results that look really great, but perhaps they are not. So what we want is actually we want to go and uh, instead of just having one train test split, we actually want a number of train test splits. This is what we've done here. So basically, this is the same chart. But what we've done here is we produce various clusters like this with different train test splits. And you can see that the regression lines are still always more or less similar. Of course, they vary a little bit. Uh, that's expected. But what we can see is, in any case here, there is always a spill from our training data into our test data, which means the strategy is actually very robust. And this is really something that we would like to see when we look at micro alpha. So we want to see that because we can't be really sure whether we're overfitting or not and all these things. But we can be quite confident that if we can see this uh, correlation here, that there is at least our strategy produces some information overflow into tests or into data sets that we haven't seen yet. And this, this is really interesting. Now, uh, the next step that we normally do in machine learning is called aggregation. So uh, bagging, the AG of bag, B-A-G, means aggregation. Uh, the first one, the B, is bootstrap. Second part, ag is aggregation. So what we're doing here is we're combining weak alphas. And this is what you see here. This is, in fact, a, a strategy that 
I have uh, recently built uh, for a client. And so you can see that there's a lot of individual here and they're all quite different. And none of them, uh, I can assure you, looks particularly exciting. So they're all, they're all fairly uh, moderate and not really, really interesting. Um, but the interesting thing is they all have this property that they appear to be relatively robust out of samples. So I did uh, a number of tests on them and the most important uh, ones I've just shown you previously. And so I see these strategies, they don't look fantastic, but they look interesting in terms of their robustness. And so what we can no now do is, and, and this is by the way, what I call micro alphas. So they're all really small little strategies and they're all very, very different strategies as well. And I show you in a moment, the typical types of, of trading uh, processes uh, they are composed of. And so what we do then in this process of, of the uh, creating micro alphas, we actually combine them and then we build another trading strategy out of them. And we're basically taking these little specks of dust here, of gold dust, that are by themselves not particularly fantastic, but we combine them into a, you know, a solid gold bar eventually. So th this is effectively the ge geology. This is the, uh, the process that I also, or other people as well, sometimes call alpha mining. And of course you will, or a lot of you as quants will go, well, you know, it, it can be quite dangerous to do this because uh, you could just go get lots and lots of alphas and just cherry pick the ones that are really good. Well, this is actually uh, really a good point. And one case to prevent the cherry picking is to run them through, for example, the rigorous test that I've shown you previously. And if you do that, then uh, you will see a lot of the strategies that look kind of good, but are cherry picked. They will already fall out of this process straight away. Okay. so. Um, when we think about these micro alphas, uh, there's this fundamental law of asset management that comes into mind. And, and, and it's interesting to be aware of this. And what it means is that we've got two components. Uh, so, so IR is the information ratio, and it's a bit similar to the sharp ratio, uh, more or less the same, in fact, uh, in, its, in its essence. And it's composed of two components. It's, it's the information coefficient, which is effectively a measure of the skill of the asset manager. And the other one is the square root of the breadth. And the breadth is, for example, how many, how many assets or how many stocks or how many futures do you trade at any given time? And how correlated are they? So, I mean, if, if you have, um, you know, 2000 uh, stocks in your in your portfolio but they're all super heavily correlated then your breadth will not be very broad you know it will be very small but if you have quite a lot of different uh, uncorrelated stocks in your portfolio then you will actually achieve quite a breadth or if you um, have a lot of different trading strategies that are not really correlated with each other then you will achieve a fair amount of breadth. So skill as an asset manager is generally, you know, something you have, but it's it's actually very difficult to scale that up. Like your skill is your skill. That's what you're good at. But breadth can be breadth. <laughs> Sorry, excuse my English. That can be uh, scaled up quite significantly. So you can see here, I mean, most of the strategies, if you actually look, they're not very correlated with each other. So um, we've got about uh, 13 or so here. And so if they're not quite correlated with each other, so there's already quite a lot of uh, breadth there. And if we apply the same alphas, for example, to different assets or different stocks, different futures, then perhaps we can increase the breadth even a lot more. And that way we can scale up the performance of the strategy and hence our information ratio 
by increasing breadth. And we don't need any skill for that. We could just literally do it by uh, building perhaps better computer systems that can deal with a larger breadth. And that's really important because what that means is, hey, we can actually produce better performing strategies without really putting extra skill in. And, and, that, that, and that is basically the uh, mathematical underpinning for this. So um, when you, you know, just, just to reiterate, when we talk a high information coefficient we, and the low breadth, uh, we talk about trading styles such as uh, Warren Buffett. And if we uh, do the opposite, we have a low information coefficient perhaps, so less skill, but uh, very high breadth. Then we talk about companies like Renaissance, technology, Rentech. Now, I'm not saying that they are, uh, they have a low skill, they have a massive skill, but their breadth is actually enormous. And that's what makes them uh, so amazing. Perhaps if they didn't have that breadth, then uh, maybe their performance wasn't quite as good. I'm only guessing here, so uh, don't hold me on that. Now, um, what can we do in order to Get that breadth. So one of the things we can do is, of course, increase the number of assets we put in. But another one that is actually really, really interesting is uh, if we diversify the strategies. Now that is obviously quite a lot of work because you need to be really good at backtesting and specifically backtesting very different things. And you know, backtesting takes time and so on. Then also what I've shown you before. If you if you do a parameter sweep of many many parameters in your backtest again, that takes even more time. So it's quite a bit of work. But just uh, as you know, if we mine gold these days, we need to dig through a whole lot of dirt and rock in order to get gold dust. Uh, this is what we need to do to get good trading strategies. Now here are some of these. So we've got of course technical indicators. We have statistical anomalies. We have autocorrelation perhaps in our system, then chart patterns. So for example, like here, candlestick patterns, cross correlations between different assets. Maybe you have a cross correlation between a leading and a following asset, and then you can use that. Co-integrated pairs. So most of you will obviously understand the idea of pairs trading uh, that could be used as well. Um, then we have machine learning signals. Sometimes just generating a signal with a machine learning method that can be useful. Uh, now, what we also want to look at is different bar sizes. So we can have perhaps minute bars, hourly bars, daily bars, weekly bars, monthly bars. And we can actually apply similar trading strategies, but to different bar sizes as well, which again, uh, the idea is to increase our breadth. Obviously, these strategies need to be checked and they need to have some sort of merit in terms of their performance. If you just plug in any strategy, it will not work. You, you need to have strategies that have some sort of performance uh, associated with them. And then um, there's also time-based signals. Uh, and, and perhaps you could understand this, that you know a signal that only fires on uh, Friday at uh, 2 p.m. or every third uh, Thursday of the month also. So we've got these time-based signals, and of course you can combine these time-based signals with other signals, and you could say, well, if this uh, pattern is emerging and it's uh, the second Friday of the month, uh, then we trade, otherwise we won't trade. So oftentimes micro-alphas uh, can be composed of perhaps a low volume, so, so, so low trade, low numbers of trades, but quite high confidence. Or sometimes they can also be quite low confidence, but lots and lots and lots of trades. And it's good to have uh, different types of these strategies in your overall composition. All right. Now, once we have found a number of alphas uh, through the methods I've just briefly shown you here, then what we need to do is we need to add some weighting to them. Now, normally um, the way I do it is in a hierarchical sense. So I start with the assets and I give uh, each asset that I trade a certain weighting in my overall portfolio. And then uh, what I also do a step underneath, I weight uh, strategies as well. So each strategy has a certain parameter 
says or this says is 0 0.1 or 0 0.02 or so so each strategy gets a certain weight now how do i get to these weights um again there is a bit of potential for overfitting so you got to be careful generally what i do is once i've determined those weights they will stay there for at least oh well depends on on depends on what you do but normally my 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 idea is that if you have a daily trading strategy they stay for at least a year if you have a for example minutely strategy they stay there for at least two to three weeks or probably a month so we want them to be uh, reasonably robust and consistent and not uh, change them all the time so at least in my opinion on my my research i found that for example a walk forward optimization with those micro alphas really doesn't work and i i would i would probably stay away from them now uh, what kind of types of weighting could we use in fact equal weights you might think oh this is really trivial but it's been shown over and over again that equal weights are actually a pretty good way of weighting portfolios of whether it's strategies or assets so don't dismiss equal weighting specifically if you think well if i add more complex weighting to it it makes my strategy really really complicated and difficult and perhaps uh, equal weights perform not quite as good but pretty good so often just for the sake of simplification equal weights are actually often not a bad thing because you got to remember uh, when you build the software around what i'm presenting you here that's already complex enough. If you add all these complex weighting schemes, it makes it even more difficult. Now I do this, um, I've got the software for that, but it's definitely, um, you know, qu quite involved. And, and uh, of course, if, you, if you're a computer scientist, it may not be so bad, but not everyone is, and not even computer scientists always get it right. Now, um, another way to weight things is, of course, the uh, famous tangency portfolio. You can see this here. All these dots are different uh, or strategies with, for different portfolio weights or sets of portfolio weights. And we get this uh, official frontier here. We've got uh, the risk on the X axis and the expected returns on the Y axis. It's actually quite easy to look at expected returns for our alphas because you know we've got our trading signal and then we got the the return of the next period which is really our expected return so our alpha signals have already that very nice predicted predictive expected return classical finance of an expected return is just the average of the previous returns which is a terrible measure of course but we as we produce these alphas and we research them our expected return is a lot more precise and so um, our tangency portfolio will actually be a lot more interesting. Now, usually the tangency portfolio is a tangent from the uh, zero point somewhere here, perhaps, to the tangent of the efficient frontier. And that basically gives you the, high, the point with the highest sharp ratio on this tangent. And so you can use this to get the best uh, risk-adjusted returns uh, for your combined portfolio. There is also another uh, weighting scheme, and Ralph Wins uh, wrote about this in his books. Uh, it's called Optimal F. So the two tangency portfolio in Optimal F they have very, very they have almost opposite goals. Optimal F is really to ramp up your profits in your strategy, but with maximum volatility. So um, um, Ralph Wins talks about you know a strategy can only really produce super high returns if your drawdown is really really big so he accepts that uh, for the sake of actually achieving really high returns for strategies and this is how he weights his strategies accordingly so it's an interesting one for example if you are a retail trader and quite risk tolerant then optimal f might be for you if you're more of an asset manager and you manage lots of client assets you really don't want to get uh, your clients through a roller coaster ride of huge, huge drawdowns. So you probably want to more work with the tangency portfolios or some other uh, similar things like like Litterman or, or, or similar portfolio schemes. Okay, so um, this uh, we, we then once we have the all these uh, 
things uh, done, the weighting and so on, we're actually producing a trading signal from our uh, different strategies and assets. And the trading signal, of course, is a result of our portfolio weights and our uh, signals themselves. So quite often um, when I produce signals, I normalize them to some way by Z scoring them. And the other way to do this is of course, um, if it's a long signal, set it to plus one, if it's a short signal to minus one, or if it's no signal zero. So it really depends um, um, what your philosophy is in, in how you wanna produce your signals. So there's various schemes that you could use. Um, but what ends up happening is that you you get a uh, position change over time, and you can see this here in this chart. So so uh, we're actually leveraging our assets up and or our portfolio up and down. And so there's times, as you can see, for example, here, that we are very uh, very little invested. So effectively, our overall uh, combination of micro alphas tells us oh you know keep your position really small but then other times like here and and this is actually uh you can see this uh this is april uh 2022 uh and um uh, you know we suddenly leverage really high and then we oscillate between high and low um you can also see here uh interesting that this was uh, uh april uh 2020 and it's quite dense here. So this is quite a, a phase of relatively high leverage in this region as well. And so what happens is though, we've got, um, as, as we use these micro alphas, we can end up with really high fluctuations in the signals. Now, in fact, these fluctuations here are not as high as it might look because uh, the resolution isn't very good, but nevertheless, um, fluctuations can be high. And this can be a problem because it's a it's a real drag on your portfolio in terms of your transaction costs. And you need to understand as you produce these signals, uh, how you produce them and also what your ex, uh, transaction costs are. Now, in, in, in my case, on my, my business, what I usually uh, do is I accept that we have high turnovers sometimes for our strategies or reasonably high turnovers. For this particular strategy that I'm showing you here, the turnover daily is about 5%. But what I do is I actually make sure my execution is really, really good. And I try to really minimize my transaction costs with execution. And, and this is uh, super interesting. Also, another thing that is important here is that this strategy was designed to be long only. And of course, long only strategies for equities such as this can be a little bit tricky. And so what we do is we actually, uh, with the scaling, we actually get this sort of long short effect. So even though it's long only because sometimes we're scaling down really low, that has kind of a quasi short uh, effect as well. And that helps us to really mitigate our risk exposure uh, quite well for the strategy. Now, there's also interestingly a uh, what I call a weekday effect. So, when you actually look at types of strategies, what you often find is that there is a, a quite a, a different uh, uh, position size uh, for different weekdays. And you can see this here on on Monday uh, zero. We, we've got a usually pretty high position sizes and then it peters off during the end of the week and there's various reasons uh, for it and it's interesting to do these analytics because just simply perhaps by by having more positions at the beginning of the week and less by the end of the week you could almost have a strategy around that if you look at that so so you know i'm just talking you know there's of course different ways to look at strategies and strategy ideas here now, um, talking a little bit about execution, this is a typical execution test. So what I want is effectively, uh, I submit my, my trades and then I wanna minimize transaction costs. And generally uh, I use some trading algorithm for this, in this case it's called a rival price. And you can see that a lot of these curves here that the executions is basically starting 
uh, with a uh, target position and then that gets filled more and more and then when we're here at zero the whole target position is basically filled what you can see is if, if you take all these very very different execution curves and, and you overlay them and take the average you can actually see that there's a really interesting uh, curve here emerging and statistically you can actually say oh okay this follows a specific model and this model is called the Almgren Almgren Chris model, which is quite well defined here with this uh, red curve, and then uh, we've got our you know execution here that that more or less uh, follows that model, and what that does is it actually tells us, oh okay, if we can build an execution that that follows that model, then we can say, well, this is really close to the best execution we can actually achieve statistically, and in this case, you can see that that um, the average spread for for all these different uh, executions here is uh, 1.9 cents, but the the gain from the best bid or offer is 1.4. We're actually getting execution better than mid price. So not only that we can achieve mid price, you can actually use execution in a good way to sometimes get better than mid price execution, and then of course that saves us enormous amounts of transaction costs and we can exploit smaller edges uh, through that which is good news of course because it means we can add more micro alphas to our model that have really small trading edges so this is uh, the final result this, this is in uh, what I presented to you here is an ESG strategy so it trades long only uh, ESG components um, and you can see down here this is the ESG benchmark and the black line here is at the effectively we're out of sample or where the live trading started for the strategy and you can see we had a bit of a drawdown straight uh, before it started but then you can also see that that out of sample as the uh, ESG benchmark went down our micro alpha strategy was a bit volatile, more volatile than before, but it still performed well given the very, very rocky underlying market. And you can see here, for example, uh, we've got an improve, improvement from the benchmark of 0 0.51 to a sharp ratio of 1.34. Probably even more interesting is the Sortino. So some of you who don't know, the Sortino is basically like the sharp ratio, but it only looks at the standard deviation of the negative returns. So uh, the improvement here is basically from 0 0.69 to 2.43, which is really quite big. And that means that actually the sharp ratio is bogged down a little bit because we quite often have quite strong positive returns. And as you probably know, it's positive returns also punish the sharp ratio and reduce the standard deviation, hen uh, increase the standard deviation hence getting a lower sharp ratio, but the Sortino or the difference here shows that we in fact get uh, quite a lot of large positive returns, which are reflected in the Sortino ratio. So you can see basically, um, this was a typical uh, research uh, for micro alphas for this uh, ESG strategy that, that I'm running. And um, it really makes uh, a big difference if you have a well-designed strategies uh, strategy going forward and you know this this one is is just a, a typical example of micro alpha and i can tell you esg so environmental social governments governance uh, uh, stocks are in fact quite difficult to trade and the ex because you know you've got a long only exposure they're very correlated to the u.s market so so achieving this is actually a very positive outcome and so this is um, uh, finishing my talk. Uh, I just uh, want to give a little announcement that I'm actually working on a Quantra course on micro alphas. It's pretty much uh, the, the very raw version of it is pretty much finished. There's already this, there's a lot of content. I talk about how you build the back tests to make them lightning fast, how you actually generate and design a whole platform that trades that. Uh, there's there's a lot there's everything is coded up so you can really just take the code and play with it test it and so on so if you're interested in this um 
that's coming out pretty soon. Now, um, since this is finishing my talk, I'm not sure if I have much time for questions. So uh, if there is, uh, please fire them away and I hope I can answer a few. Thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation, Dr. Stark. Uh, uh, we will now start picking questions from audience. So we'll try to ask a few. Uh, will you, might, will you uh, tell them? Will you um, talk? To me, about or will you give them to me? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I just, uh, I'll just, uh, you know. Uh, 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 so I'll request audience to put those questions in the questions panel. I'll read them out loud. Uh, meanwhile, uh, I would also uh, like to showcase uh, this. I guess. Uh, Okay, so yeah, so meanwhile, I would like to share about our upcoming anniversary sale. Starting tomorrow, we'll be offering 75% discount on all contract courses. This offer will start early for all the conference attendees uh, with the additional benefits. So attendees of uh, this conference can avail 20% uh, discount on top of the upcoming anniversary offer by using coupon code uh, and for the next 10 hours only. Okay. So, uh, and also uh, uh, based on the uh, session that we have, uh, I would also like to uh, request everyone to, you know, if they are really serious about uh, quantitative approach in uh, options and uh, futures trading, uh, they can uh, look at uh, this course, uh, that uh, this learning track that I'm sharing. So feel free to check that out. And uh, now uh, that said, I'll be picking up some one or two questions uh all right so yeah so there is this one question by hunter uh, hunter asks you mentioned about uh, overfitting being an unavoidable issue i'm wondering how you measure and set acceptance and criteria for a level of fit oh for so so what you're asking is how i measure or if I have criteria for the level of overfitting that that I have, is okay. that right? Yeah, I'm wondering how you measure and set acceptance criteria for level of fit. Oh, acceptance criteria. Well, it's 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 really um, it it's actually really really difficult. There isn't uh, really a good measure for it. I mean, um, really. One of the, you know, the best measure that, that I have personally is what I've shown you there is this um, correlation between uh, the train and the test metric that you choose, whether it may be PNL or Sharp ratio or Sortino, whatever metric or profit factor, whatever metric you, you choose. Uh, and and for, for, for a wide range of parameter sets, but really um, it it's actually not, not that straightforward and 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 quite frankly there is a little bit of experience and alchemy so to speak also required when you truly select uh the uh for example your micro alphas one thing you can do is as you uh as you add more alphas you could actually with each edition um run another test and then see whether your sharp ratio improves or not or whether your whatever metric you choose, whether it improves or not, and if it does, you accept it, and if it doesn't, you just simply reject it. Uh, so that's a possibility, but again, you got to be really careful with this. That can also quite easily lead to cherry picking. So none of what you do is really preventing you from getting some level of overfitting. You just have to really be conscious to minimize it as much as you can. I hope I hope that answers the question. Uh, uh, I hope that answers uh, your question, Hunter. Uh, so we are running out of time and we have next session to start off in a short time. Sure. So what I would sure. request everyone is to share their questions. So after, right after this session, you will be getting a survey. So mm -hmm. in that, you can ask uh, all the questions uh, that you have and we'll try to uh, uh, make, we basically we'll make sure that all those questions are answered. And we will get back to you individually and uh, share all, uh, address all your doubts and questions. Okay.
so yeah i think uh, with that said uh, i would like to again thank dr stark for taking out your time uh, this late from sydney australia and uh, uh, for the sec- second session of the day uh, that is regime definition triad between uh, goals and bears why it is simplifying why it simplifies the work uh, we'll be joined by lauren bernu from tokyo japan so i would request everyone to stay tuned and uh, i'll catch you in the next session right after in like uh, after a 15 minutes of break and uh, yeah that's about it for the first session thank you so much thomas stark and thank you uh, we hope you also enjoyed our company it was great thanks so much for having me on and i uh, hope to see you again soon bye. thank you dr stark thank you thank you bye bye Thank you.